We're so excited to have you guys again for our second week um, of staying connected, healthy, and energized during COVID-19 and beyond. My name is Yael Khan, and I'm a clinical research coordinator for the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic. The Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at the Mass General Cancer Center is focused on providing cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers with tailored recommendations for improving physical fitness, nutrition, quality of life, or cancer prognosis. Our team is thrilled to be able to connect with you guys for the next six weeks virtually. In this week's session, we will review evidence-based nutrition recommendations for cancer survivors and discuss how food can be used to strengthen your body during treatment and beyond. We will also share a brief cooking demonstration that illustrates how to incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your day. It is my pleasure to introduce our three panelists for this evening, medical oncologist, Dr. Amy Commander, and dietitians Carol Sullivan and Samantha Bateman. Dr. Amy Commander is the Director of Breast Oncology and Cancer Survivorship at the Mass General Cancer Center in Waltham and at Newton Wellesley Hospital. She is also Co-Medical Director of the Mass General Cancer Center in Waltham. Dr. Commander is a breast oncologist who is dedicated to improving the quality of life and outcome of cancer patients through important lifestyle interventions, including exercise, diet, mind and body interventions, and educational initiatives. She practices what she preaches, having run the Boston Marathon for the past six years for charitable causes. In 2019, she ran the Boston Marathon to support development of the Paving the Path to Wellness program, which is a 12-week lifestyle medicine-based survivorship program for women with breast cancer. Our next panelist tonight is Carol Sullivan, a registered dietitian with more than 15 years of experience in the field, including a decade practicing as a certified specialist in oncology nutrition at MGH. She has also been lucky to work with athletes of all abilities for the past 10 years. Carol is passionate about helping people feel better through healthy food and seeing the good in food. She will help you sort through the nutrition no noise and make positive health changes. Our final panelist for tonight is Samantha Bateman, a registered dietitian practicing in oncology for three years, who recently joined the Cancer Center and the Lifestyle Medicine team at Mass General. She enjoys providing evidence-based medical nutrition therapy to individuals with cancer and cancer survivors, while creating and maintaining a positive relationship with food. In her spare time, Samantha enjoys all sports, especially football, fitness, and spending time with her fiance and dog. Please note that during this presentation tonight, you will be on mute, but please feel free to post any questions that come up in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. And we will reserve questions for the second half of tonight's session. So without further ado, I'd love to pass it on to my colleagues. Thank you, Yael, for that kind introduction. We are so grateful that all of you have joined us tonight to learn about evidence-based recommendations for nutrition in cancer survivorship. As Yael noted, I'm a breast oncologist and all day long in clinic, my patients ask me, Dr. Commander, what should I be eating to optimize my outcome for my cancer? What should I be doing in terms of exercise? What else can I do to optimize my health? And this lecture series will help address these questions. It is my privilege to lead this session tonight alongside my nutrition colleagues, Carol Sullivan and Samantha Bateman. The goals of our session tonight are outlined on this slide. First, we will review the principles of lifestyle medicine and how this field is relevant to cancer survivorship. Second, we will discuss how healthy eating habits might optimize health after a cancer diagnosis help and help, help prevent other chronic diseases. Third, we will offer actionable tips for incorporating more healthy foods into your diet and offer strategies for mindful eating. You may ask, what is lifestyle medicine? Lifestyle medicine is the therapeutic use of evidence-based lifestyle interventions to treat and prevent lifestyle-related diseases in a clinical setting. Lifestyle medicine empowers individuals with the knowledge and life skills to make effective behavior changes that address the underlying cause of disease. This figure illustrates the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, which we are covering in this lecture series. Last week, we had the opportunity to learn from Drs. O'Donnell and Knowlton about the importance of physical activity in cancer survivorship. This week, we get to focus on healthy eating. 
in the subsequent sessions, which I hope you will join, we will focus on these other important topics, including how to manage stress, the importance of social connections, how to improve your sleep, and the importance of avoiding risky substances. How can lifestyle medicine help cancer patients? Well, we know from evidence in the literature that these interventions can do a number of things to include improving quality of life, diminishing side effects from treatment, including physical function, improving mood, fatigue, and cancer outcomes. So again, these are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, and we are privileged tonight to focus on nutrition. Some of you may be familiar with this figure of a healthy eating plate taken from the Harvard School of Public Health website. If you're not familiar with this image, I highly recommend going on that website to look at this image and reading the description. So this is a really beautiful depiction of a healthy diet, which really focuses on diet quality. We know there are so many diets out there and it's hard to know which is the best one. What is emphasized in this figure is that your diet really should include a large emphasis on fruits and vegetables, which could be half of your plate, whole grains, and a healthy protein source, as well as healthy oils. And in the course of this presentation, we are gonna outline how you can achieve this with each of your meals throughout the day. This is a figure from the American Institute of Cancer Research, which is another excellent resource for cancer survivorship. And it really outlines recommendations for cancer prevention, which are of course very applicable to cancer survivors as well. And we are going to cover each of these topics for the most part in this presentation tonight. Again, a focus on the importance of eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. The importance of achieving a healthy body weight, limiting consumption of red and processed meat, limiting consumption of fast foods and other highly processed foods, limiting alcohol consumption, limiting sugar sweetened drinks. And as we discussed last week, it's so important to be physically active. So I also recommend the AICR website as a great resource to look into each of these topics further. Interestingly, last week, the American Cancer Society published this new guideline for diet and physical activity for cancer prevention. This is an excellent paper that is available to all of you on the American Cancer Society website. And the website is listed below, cancer.org. You can read the summary or pull the original paper. What's really fascinating is that is this is a guideline developed by a national panel of experts in cancer research, prevention, epidemiology, public health, and policy, and reflects the current latest scientific evidence related to dietary and activity patterns in and cancer risk, and certainly for survivorship as well. These guidelines are also very consistent with guidelines from the American Heart Association and American Diabetes Association for the prevention of coronary heart disease and diabetes, as well as general health. So our talk tonight will really focus on the recommendations from this paper, and I highly recommend this if you would like to do further reading on your own. So here's a summary, and this is really essentially a more detailed outline of what we will cover tonight. So the World Cancer Research Foundation and American Institute of Cancer Research, along with American Cancer Society, have outlined these key nutrition guidelines, which are important for cancer prevention as well as survivorship. And they really focus on three areas, diet quality, weight control, and dietary supplements. So in the course of this presentation, we are gonna address each of these areas and explain the evidence and why these are important for cancer survivorship. Another really interesting component of the American Cancer Society's recommendation that was published last week is a new focus on the importance of community support. And I know one of my psychology colleagues who's speaking, I think next week, was really excited to see this included in the guideline because we know that community support is so key for us to make healthy changes in our lifestyle. We know that making healthy eating choices is really a group effort based on social, economic, and cultural factors, which all play a very important role. Any change that you wanna make in your lifestyle to be healthier will be much easier if you're a part of a community that supports this behavior. And I'm sure we'll discuss these, this aspect of the guideline further in subsequent talks. On that note, I am going to turn this presentation over to my nutrition colleague, Samantha Bateman.
So, oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. Um, thank you, Dr. Commander, for that great handoff. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, to kick off talking about the importance of nutrition and diet quality, we will first discuss the impact of sugar-sweetened beverages on our diet. And overall, the recommendation is to limit sugar-sweetened beverages as much as possible. What are sugar-sweetened beverages? The, this is, these are any beverages that are sweetened with added sugars, including white sugar, brown sugar, fructose, honey, high fructose corn syrup, raw sugar, and many others. They, sugar can be listed under many names in the, in the ingredient section, so you have to be careful. But other than higher, being higher in sugar, these beverages are typically higher in calories too, without adding much nutrition quality to our diet. These are what we call empty calories. And these empty calories can really contribute to weight gain, which in turn can increase risk for many different cancers. Some examples of sugar sweetened beverages include regular soda, sweet tea, and some bottles, bottled tea as well. Sugary coffee drinks, including like frappuccinos and lattes and many other um, juices that are not necessarily 100% juice have added sugar as well. Um, on this slide, there is a nutrition label for a popular soda. Um, I don't know if you guys would be able to tell which one it is, but so the, a couple things to look for in a nutrition label. One is the serving size. So for this particular soda, it's a 12 fluid ounce serving size, which is about a can of soda. Two, the calories. So we're looking at 140 calories for that 12 fluid ounce serving size, as well as the added sugars. And this is what's highlighted here. This particular beverage has 39 grams of added sugar. And you, the total carbohydrates on a nutrition label also includes the added sugars. But for this particular beverage, all of the carbohydrates are coming from added sugar. So what does 39 grams of added sugar really mean? We're looking at over three tablespoons of table sugar in this one beverage. The 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend no more than 10% of your total calorie intake come from added sugars. So if you're eating about 2,000 calories a day, you're looking at no more than 200 calories coming from added sugars. If you have two cans of regular soda, say one for lunch and one with dinner, you're already exceeding this recommendation with just those two beverages. So if weight loss is a goal of yours, reducing consumption of sugar sweetened beverages is a really good place to start. Even if you just cut down what you're currently drinking, cut that two soda a day habit into one soda a day habit. You could also replace these beverages with water with fruit slices. This is a great time of year. It gets really hot outside. You can add some lemon and lime um, slices to your water. You can also add, you can get really, really creative with like herbs and, and different fruits, seasonal fruits that are um, available to you. Unsweetened seltzers are actually really popular right now, so that's a great alternative as well, especially if you like carbonated beverages. Unsweetened teas and coffees are also a, a, a great alternative. Next slide, please. While we are on the topic of beverages, let's touch on alcohol consumption. While it's not, it's best not to drink alcohol, but if you do, for men, the recommended limit is two drinks daily, and for women, it's one drink daily. Increased alcohol intake is correlated with increased risk for multiple cancers, and it also, and the reason for that is alcohol metabolism can damage DNA, causing inflammation in the body, which then can, um, can lead to an in increased risk in cancer. Alcohol consumption can also disrupt sleep patterns, which can contribute to weight gain and, and poor eating habits, as well as it limits inhibition food choices. If you have an extra glass of wine with dinner, you may not eat as much as you would typically eat. So it's just something to keep in mind. This slide has a great um, depiction of what a serving size really is for an alcohol be alcoholic beverage. Um, so 12 fluid ounces of regular beer, so a regular can of beer, um, eight to nine fluid ounces of malt liquor, five fluid ounces of table wine, um, and one and a half fluid ounces of hard liquor, so tequila, vodka, gin. Um, something to keep in mind, these alcoholic beverages by themselves range from 100 calories to 150 calories, depending on what you're, what you're drinking. Um, and this does not include any additives. So if you like a mixed drink in the evening, 
That doesn't include if you add a sugar sweetened beverage like a soda to your liquor, you, that cocktail can be almost 300 calories just for that one cocktail. Something else to keep in mind, the glasses that you're drinking your alcoholic beverage in. I don't know about you guys, but my wine glasses at home are way bigger than five fluid ounces. So just keep that in mind. And also with beer glasses, if you drink craft beer or something out of a larger container, um, pint glasses are 16 ounces, not 12. So just keep, um, keep an eye on your portion sizes. Next slide, please. We also want to limit consumption of red meat and processed meats as well. Um, we want to, red meat, the, the recommended limit is 12 to 18 ounces per week. To put that in um, real life terms, I guess, three ounces, um, which is the typical serving size for any meat, poultry, fish. Um, it's about a deck of cards or the size of your palm, depending on how big your hands are. So really you can eat three six ounce steaks a week, um, but we really want to avoid processed meats, both an excess consumption of red meat and processed meats can really increase your, your risk to, for um, colorectal cancer. Processed meat, it's really any ham, bacon, cold cuts, hot dogs, sausages, any meat that's preserved by smoking, curing, salting, or the addition of chemical preservatives. But luckily there's a lot of different options that you can replace meat with. You don't have to cut meat out of your diet. You can just replace it with a leaner cut of meat, like a turkey breast, chicken breast, fish. Um, replace ground beef in your chili with ground turkey or ground chicken, um, or even plant-based protein sources. And Carol um, will discuss a little bit more about this, but beans and lentils are a great way. They're filling, they have a little bit of fiber, and they're very versatile, so it's a great, great alternative that's plant-based. Next slide, please. And I don't think this slide will come to surprise to any of you, but we also wanna limit consumption of fast foods and other higher calorie processed foods, as well as refined grains. So these foods are typically more calories, more sodium, more fat. Common high calorie processed foods or energy dense foods chips, cookies, candy bars, baked goods, sugary cereals, fried foods, they all taste delicious, but they're, um, they're more calories than what they're worth um, long term. And there's also this misconception that fast food or drive throughs might be faster than preparing meals at home. Um, I know we, we've, been create, we've been preparing a lot of meals at home since we've been in quarantine, um, so there, there might be an itch to eat out a lot once we um, the world op starts opening up again but just a little planning and before you go to the grocery store get quick grab-and-go meals that you can throw together you can take to work with you if you're in the car a lot um, and we have some examples up here on this slide so some alternatives would be carrots or celery with hummus hummus is a great way to get some extra protein fiber it's very versatile you can make your own or buy store-bought you can even save and sell the individually packaged um, snack size hummus. It's really easy to grab and go. Um, fruits with peanut butter or other nut butters, it's a very, very filling snack. Uh, nuts in general are fantastic. You just have to watch the portion size with those. Cottage cheese with yogurt or cottage cheese and yo or yogurt with fruit is another great one. Homemade salad with chicken or beans. This can be a chicken salad with maybe Greek yogurt instead of mayo, or a three bean salad, or even a leafy salad with, with chicken and beans if you're, if you're feeling creative. Vegetable wrap with hummus. Humm hummus, again, is a, is a great additive to most meals. Smoothies, which we'll actually, um, we'll look at a, one of my favorite smoothies later on in this presentation. And overnight oats is a great breakfast that you can prep the night before and um, put some rolled oats, your choice of milk, um, put it in the fridge and then grab and go, put some fruit on it and it's ready to go for you in the morning. Um, and I will turn the presentation over to my colleague, Carol Sullivan. Yeah. 
Thank you, Sam, for the handoff, and thank you, Dr. Commander and Yael, for the wonderful introductions as well. So moving along through diet quality, um, which is so important for weight control and also prevention of cancer and chronic disease, will come to no surprise as well that the dietitians are recommending people eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, so to try to make this a little bit more interesting, we want to think about the reasons that we're asking people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And going back to what Dr. Commander mentioned, there is a profound amount of research, especially in some of the more studied cancers, including breast, prostate, colorectal, for more fiber and more total servings a day of fruits and vegetables, helping to prevent the disease in the first place and helping possibly with prevention of recurrence in combination with all of these other important lifestyle factors that we're talking about in this series. So while no one food exists or one nutrient exists in a vacuum, it is worth noting some of the power of the different colors of the fruits and vegetables and plant foods that we might be eating. So for example, a well-known one being the red color which is lycopene in tomatoes and also watermelon. We're coming up on it being, pop, uh, being a popular time of year for watermelon and tomatoes, and the carotenoids in different orange and red fruits and vegetables as well, where we know that the carotenoids can actually, we've found that the carotenoid, women who have more carotenoids in their bloodstream actually have less breast cancer, just as an example. Um, I believe Sam is gonna be talking about cherries later on, another red fruit that are really, that's really high in vitamin C, which is really important for adequate healing. Um, and cherries do happen to have some melatonin as well, which makes Sam's smoothie a great after-dinner treat since melatonin can help with sleep. So just recognizing that fruits and vegetables are an important part of our diet, not just because they might help with weight control, but they have all of these really awesome bioactive properties that can do really cool things in our bodies. So thinking about um, tips for success. So how can we actually get more of these into our bodies? And these are tips that I use at home. So keeping frozen fruit and vegetables ready to go at all times because even if you're just making a quick pasta meal, you can easily throw a bunch of vegetables into the microwave. You can add a squeeze of lemon, some garlic um, to frozen too, and that can turn it into a much more interesting dish with a lot more of these vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients that are in our plant foods. Roasting vegetables brings out a ton of flavor. Keeping carrots, cucumbers, and zucchini and a fruit bowl ready so people can just grab and snack. Making sure that you're adding a fruit or vegetable to breakfast is an interesting one. A lot of people don't think about adding fruits or vegetables to breakfast, especially if you're a cereal person. Think about how you can easily add some of the delicious fresh berries that are in season right now. Or if you are an egg person, making sure that you're adding a handful of spinach or after the eggs are cooked, you can add an, a nice, splash of arugula with a little bit of olive oil and salt and pepper on top and that can add a nice little zing to eggs and then um, trail mix and dried fruit i love as a snack my kids love it as a snack dried fruit has a bad reputation for possibly having too much sugar but there's so much fiber tied into dried fruit and also the nuts that it does help to give you that nice steady blood sugar control as long as you're watching your portion and then find inspiration there's a ton of popular chefs out there, celebrity chefs who have beautiful cookbooks, beautiful cooking shows, find someone that you really like and try their recipes or blogs. Blogs are a great example too. Next slide. So the next piece of diet quality, getting more whole grains and legumes into the diet with the latest low carb fad that exists right now of people going keto and trying to cut out all of the carbohydrate in their diet, whole grains and legumes and paleo, whole grains and legumes have gotten a bad reputation. But the reason that we like whole grains is because they give you, again, more fiber. Whole grains, if you're trying to eat more plant foods, can be really satisfying and also help you to better meet your protein needs. So what we mean when we say a whole grain is what this picture is depicting, where the outside portion of the grain is the bran, and that's the fiber. 
the next layer is the endosperm that has the nutrients, especially the B vitamins that are really important for energy utilization in our body. And then the inside layer, which is, um, excuse me, the endosperm, that's the inside layer and the germ is the middle layer. The middle portion is what's left when you have a refined carbohydrate. So like a white bread, for example, and there really isn't much nutrition there. It's kind of more of an empty calorie. So this is why there's such a push for whole grains. So there's some examples of how to get more whole grains and legumes into your diet. So Samantha mentioned some hummus ideas, so I'll skip those. But I love um, Dahl, this picture here on the left from the blogger Minimalist Baker. I love her. She does a great job including lots of interesting flavors, but minimal ingredients and minimal dishes. So if you have a family, if you get home from work late, this is a great site to visit. Um, and Dahl is definitely in my rotation as a quick, easy, plant-based meal that tastes better and better the further that you have it into the week as it's sitting in the fridge. And it's basically just lentils, garlic, ginger, turmeric, tomato, lemon, and cilantro is kind of the base. And then challenge yourself to really try a new whole grain. So quinoa has been popular for a number of years, but these other whole grains can make a dish really interesting. My favorite of these is actually farro. The salad that I'm going to show you tonight, which is a jar, mason jar salad, actually includes farro. I love it because it's like a more chewy rice and a little bit um, heartier with texture. So this Food Network recipe that's at the bottom, this farro salad with tomatoes and herbs, is actually a Giada de Laurentiis recipe, which I love her recipes. I love watching her cook. Um, so some good inspiration there. Next slide. And we all love this. The panelists here all love this quote from Michael Pollan's book, Food Rolls, and also his book, In Defense of Food, two great, great books. And the tagline is, eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. And it really can be that simple. Next slide. So how else can we get more of these local delicious fresh produce? So finding a community supported agriculture or a CSA that's local to you that you can go pick up a box of their fresh produce is a great way to support your community and also get some of this fresh um, local produce that's most nutrient dense when it's being grown in season. In addition to that, there's some other boxes that are actually delivered to your door. I'm currently on the waiting list for Misfits, this one that's listed first. There's also the Fruit Guys, Perfectly Imperfect Produce, and the Farm Box Direct. Our dietitian, Samantha Bateman, has been lucky enough to be getting her Misfits box from Misfits Market. And this is a picture of Sam with her wonderful box of produce. I believe there's also some chocolate in there, um, which Coco does have some great anti-cancer properties as well and some good phytonutrients. Um, thank you to Sam for sharing this picture. Next slide. So this is from the American Institute for Cancer Research. And I like this because it does help people see how they might be able to transition from this old American plate over to the new American plate, with the idea being the old American plate, while a popular comfort plate is about half the plate being red meat, half the plate, the rest of the plate really is carbohydrate because peas are a starchy carbohydrate, and then buttery mashed potatoes. So how can we take this plate that isn't quite health promoting, even though there are some plants on the plate and make it a little bit better and get some more nutrients in. So the next transitional plate picture has a little bit less carbohydrate. So it's only some brown rice, about a cup, which is about the size of your fist. It's a good way to measure your carbohydrate since your fist is always with you, even when you're out at a restaurant. And half the plate is your non-starchy vegetables. So these are green beans, which again, are about to be in season. I love this time of year. And then this allows you also to have a smaller portion of meat because all of the other foods, are the healthy vegetables especially, are kind of pushing the protein portion down. Um, and this also would allow you to maybe, if you have room in your budget, to buy a little bit better quality meat, which you can also get some good local meats if you visit your local farmer's market, which the farmer's markets are opening up, um, but they are, they are taking COVID precautions. So that would be good to hit up as well. 
And then this new American plate um, is half the plate is vegetables, but there's two vegetables on the plate, which was on the, the previous slide all the way on the right. But this picture I love because one pot meals like stir fries are super easy to come together and quick. And here you can really see that vegetables should be the star. So eventually transitioning over where you can kind of barely see your protein, your lean protein source and your whole grain and really a variety of colors of vegetables are on the plate. Next slide. So again, with diet quality, adding more plant-based meals is a popular phrase right now. And plant-based doesn't necessarily mean vegan. It just means adding more plants to your day, which anyone can really do. So some examples on how to improve and move towards this goal would be maybe pick one dinner a week that you can make meatless. You could use tofu as a meat substitute, which I know intimidates a lot of people, but it just has to be cooked correctly. You have to press all of the water out of it to give it the right texture. And then it really does take on the flavor of whatever you cook it with. So sauces become important and sauces really can help to make dishes come alive. This time of year with basil coming in, pesto can be delicious. There's lots of ways to make pesto without buying um, an expensive nut. You can use something a little bit less expensive than pine nuts, like a walnut. Um, so there's, there's lots of different sauces. Even tahini, if you've never used sesame as a sauce, can be really delicious as well on vegetables and plant-based dishes. Hummus again is coming up <laughs> because it's so versatile. Another idea would be to avoid meat until you get to dinner time and avoid animal products most of the day. And that'll help you to choose more, more plants during the day. And then, like Sam mentioned, a little bit of meal planning really can go a long way. If you're making a crock pot meal or an instant pot meal in the beginning of the week, and then you can even double a recipe so that you have lunches and maybe even leftover dinners if you know you have a night that you're getting home late. Um, a little bit of planning, and it is a muscle. You can kind of develop it over time once you get in the habit of of writing down what you're gonna buy at the grocery store and maybe planning on cooking a couple meals that week that you can plan on having leftovers for. And mason jar salads are actually really delicious. Um, and that's actually the example that I'm gonna to give tonight in our, our cooking demo. And these are great because you can get all of your ingredients out at once and then just layer everything in the mason jar and bring it with you to work and, and that's it, lunch is ready for the week. If you're feeling less inspired, there is a meal delivery system. If you like things like um, HelloFresh or Blue Apron, there's one called Purple Carrot as well that's vegan. Next slide. So um, again, with diet quality, perking up your taste buds by adding all of these other flavor enhancers, always have lemons and limes around, adding a squeeze of lemon or lime to cook vegetables, to soups, to grains, to legumes, and even the zest can really make all the flavors pop. Um, adding rice wine vinegar or apple cider vinegar to steamed vegetables or actually adding to your grains when they're cooking can also help enhance the flavor. And then finally, really trying new spices, um, even starting with maybe some more basic herbs that we have that are popular like thyme and oregano and basil, um, rosemary, and then maybe trying to get a little bit more experimental, which, when you're trying new spices, especially some of the Eastern Mediterranean spices, like from Anna Sorton here, um, who owns Oleana and Sarma and Sofra in Boston and Cambridge, um, you kind of need a cookbook to be your Sherpa <laughs> to get you through your first few meals of cooking with these spices. Um, so I, I do love her, her books and her recipes. You can find some of her recipes online too, if you're curious. And these spices and herbs, think about how flavorful they are. They pack a lot of phytonutrients on their own. Some of these herbs even provide good vitamins and minerals like iron. So um, it's definitely worth exploring. Next slide. So this book I just came upon, and this book is by an English gentleman named Ryan Riley. He's very young, but he's very talented. And this book is completely dedicated to people who have ongoing taste changes from treatment. 
And it's a beautiful book. It's very modern and it's very easy to follow. He actually has um, a whole section in the beginning explaining taste. It's really interesting. And if you have ongoing taste issues, I highly recommend this book and following him on social media. Next slide. So moving on um, from diet quality to just focusing a little bit more on body weight, where the goal is to be as lean as possible without being underweight. We've already talked about diet quality at length. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the timing of eating. And the next slide, we're going to do a mindful eating exercise. And then we're not going to talk about these next two things in detail, but I just want to mention your own hierarchy of needs. So thinking about what you have going on in your life and what you have time to really do. And, and it is important. Um, I think some people are really hard on themselves about making diet changes and um, that can just kind of perpetuate the problem. And you need to give yourself some grace if you do have a lot going on and reaching out to a dietitian or someone who, um, knows how to cook well can be great support if you did want to start making those changes and you have a super busy life. And then the next one is um, therapy, considering the role of counseling or behavioral therapy if you feel like you um, are in a dark place with food and it, it definitely happens. Next slide. So this slide is about the role of meal timing. And these are some interesting questions that have been answered in research in the past handful of years. The first one being, how might meal timing affect metabolic health? And in this study, lean women were randomized to an eating early versus eating later at night groups. And women who ate later in the day were found to actually have metabolic alterations that were detrimental to their health, which is very interesting. And the microbiome is very hot right now. So the next question is, what is the role of the gut microbiome in the timing of meals? So we know that the gut microbiome actually has daily rhythms. If your microbiome, the bacteria in your gut, has its own circadian rhythm, which is very cool. Um, and we know that this rhythm can change to an obesogenic pattern when you're eating late at night. So your bacteria are actually changing in a way where it wants your body to gain weight. The next question is, does prolonged nightly fasting, which fasting is another very hot topic right now, which I don't really support because I'm less about deprivation and more about what can we add to your diet and add to your life versus taking it away. But anyway, this, um, this study showed that fasting more than 13 hours can possibly affect metabolic health and possibly um, improve sleep duration, and as a result, lower your your body's your blood level of HbA1c, your um, average blood sugar over the past three months, and that in turn impacted um, cancer recurrence in women with breast cancer. At Mass General, we actually have a pilot study that's accruing right now for breast cancer survivors for nightly fasting. And if you are interested in this study, then you can reach out to your breast oncologist. And really the goal when we're thinking about timing is trying to eat during daytime hours. So avoiding eating after now when it's dusk or getting dark and trying to do a 13 hour fast. So really, you know, your last bite of food being 8 p.m. and your first bite being 9 a.m., which, which isn't that really far out there. Next slide, please. So this next section is mindful eating. So really, especially right now, during this time where we've all been home and we've all been staring at the same food, um, thinking about why we're eating. I'm hearing a lot about um, some mindless eating and people getting into habits that weren't necessarily there before COVID. So thinking about why we eat. So thinking about your hunger and where you are kind of on a scale of zero to 10, how hungry you are, and if you actually need to fuel yourself at that point. But of course, there's way more reasons that we eat other than just um, other than just hunger, of course. So um, I want to actually get to our mindful eating exercise. So if you brought a raisin or if you brought a piece of chocolate, I want you to right now um, Pick up your piece of chocolate or your raisin and start connecting to your breath and your body. 
um, feel your feet on the ground and notice how you're experiencing this moment, moment and tune into the awareness or sensation that you have in your body. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you full? And now bring your attention to what you might have in your hand and notice the color, shape, and texture. And now I actually want you to bring it up to your mouth and bring it up to your nose and smell it. And now put that item in your mouth and don't chew it yet, just let it sit and notice the flavor and the texture. And now you can actually bite the food, bite your raisin or your chocolate. And when you're ready, you can swallow and just notice the sensation of the food in your throat and moving down to your stomach. And just keep this in mind at your next meal. Next slide. We already did that. I love this cartoon from Dr. Commander. Am I still hungry or am I just eating this because it's still here? We've all thought that before. So we can't address this one bullet about body weight without talking about underweight, which is very distressing to people who have lost a, weight, a lot of weight going through treatment. So we're talking about doing some of the opposite things that we would do for trying to eat less energy dense foods during the day. We actually wanna make sure we're eating energy dense foods and prioritizing them when you're eating. So adding more nut butters and avocado and olive oil and really thinking about the timing of your eating, trying to eat at least every two to three hours. Some people's hunger cues become diminished and maybe even setting a clock or a timer on your phone um, to try to remember to eat often. And then fortifying, we talk about this word fortifying all the time, fortify foods with extra calories as much as possible. And remember that every little bit counts, even if it's just a bite. And trying to use healthy fats when cooking and drizzling extra onto foods like olive oil and avocado oil. Um, and this is one that um, people aren't always keen on, but actually stirring peanut butter and almond butter into hot cereals like oatmeal and cream of wheat and adding them to smoothies. But it can be really delicious and a great way to add some, some good healthy calories. Drinking your nutrition if you need to gain weight is also a great idea. Liquids move through your digestive tract a little bit more quickly. So get, getting together a smoothie that adds some of those nutrient dense healthy items like nut butters, a little bit of oil, um, a full fat oat milk could be a great option or cow milk. And there's lots of options um, for a healthy high calorie smoothie. And if you're underweight and you're having trouble gaining weight, we would love to help you. If you've had a GI surgery, malabsorption of nutrients can be an issue and there are things that we can do to help that. And if you are someone who is being fed through a tube, there's things that we can do to help you with that as well. Next slide. And now um, Amy Commander, Dr. Commander, is going to talk about dietary supplements. Thank you, Carol and Samantha, for that excellent review. I know I learned a lot tonight, even though I've heard you present this before. So thank you so much. Um, so a question that comes up a lot in my clinic every single day is about what is the role of dietary supplements, both for cancer prevention and for my patients who are in the survivorship phase of care. And you know, just want to define what is a dietary supplement. This includes products such as vitamins and minerals, amino acids, herbs, botanicals, and other kinds of ingredients. I think what's really important to note about dietary supplements is that what we see on the shelf in our grocery store may or may not actually contain the substances noted on those labels and actually could be harmful. So you have to be really careful about what you purchase if you're looking into dietary supplements. As Carol and Samantha have beautifully outlined in their presentations, food, those beautiful colors we saw on those slides, that is the best optimal source of vitamins, minerals, and other bioactive food components. So really eating all those beautiful red, green, orange vegetables is really the best way to get nutrients into your body. Supplements really should not be used to prevent cancer. Many of these things have been studied and have not been found to be beneficial. 
Interestingly, I've noted I'm a breast oncologist and a recent study published in the journal Clinical Oncology looked at a population of patients with breast cancer who had taken various antioxidants or other dietary supplements during chemotherapy. And unfortunately, it was found that these supplements during treatment could have a negative impact. So I guess my message is if you really want to take a dietary supplement, I strongly recommend that you bring the bottle into your visit with your doctor or nurse practitioner, review it and make sure it's safe to take that during your treatment. We all go on the internet all the time to Google various things, but you know you have to be careful with Dr. Google. I would recommend this website that's part of the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements, which is a great way to look up specific supplements, understand what's in them, what the potential benefits might be. So that is what I would refer, refer you to if you wanna find out more about dietary supplements. Now I wanna move on to the exciting part of our presentation. If this wasn't exciting enough, we're gonna have two great cooking demos um, featuring our amazing nutritionist. This is just a quick summary of what we just discussed. This is just the message to save room for your salad, especially after you see Carol's salad that she's gonna show. I also wanna put in a major plug for the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, which Yael outlined at the beginning of the presentation. If you are interested in learning more about nutrition for yourself and your personal cancer and your history or other aspects of lifestyle medicine that you would like to pursue, ask your doctor to refer you to this clinic and Yael can tell us more about that at the end. So finally, I'm gonna stop this presentation and we're gonna do two brief cooking demonstrations which really illustrate how you can incorporate more of these healthy foods into your day. So on that note, Samantha is going to go first. All right, okay. So for my smoothie, um, I just want to, it's really quick, um, really want to highlight cherries. So I have frozen cherries just because they're easy, but cherries are in season right now. And if you love cherries as much as I do, I always keep them on hand. They're really, they're really versatile. Um, and they're really, really yummy at all, all year round when they're frozen. I also use oat milk or any, you can really use any type of milk. I just happen to have oat milk on hand. Um, and then Greek yogurt. So I have plain, but for the smoothie that I'm, I'm making today, I just have Greek vanilla yogurt a little bit of vanilla extract. Um, and you can, it's really easy to save your ears. I already blended one up earlier today, but it's super easy, it's beautiful, and it's absolutely delicious. And then Carol will show you a nice salad. Hi. Oops. Oh, boy. There we go. Um, this is more of an um, assembly line salad. So I did portion out all of my ingredients, but um, just to start, I have a really simple salad that is very summery. It's a summer strawberry mint mason jar salad. So I have my mason jar ready to go. If I was prepping them for the whole week, I would have you know three, four, or five laid out. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna show you how I would whip together the dressing, which I already have. Um, if you like salads, I highly recommend making your own dressing all the time. Once you start making your own, you'll never go back. This is a pre-lined um, salad container that has a nice, beautiful little spout. So it's about half a cup of extra virgin olive oil, half a cup of aged balsamic vinegar, two tablespoons of maple syrup, which is a great flavor enhancer, especially if you have taste changes. Um, some mustard, again, another great flavor enhancer if you have taste changes. Some salt and pepper, and that is it. There's lots of variations of this vinaigrette out there. Sometimes um, with fall salads, I like to use um, like a chopped sh or minced shallot in here too, which is really delicious and beautiful. And then just shake, and then pour some of your dressing into your mason jar, just maybe a couple or a few tablespoons. And then I have farro here. I mentioned farro is my favorite whole grain. So I would probably just put like maybe, depending on depending on my activity level for the week and how many steps I'm planning to get in, right? Um, I might put more or less farro in here. 
So farro and then um, strawberries, which these um, are looking really beautiful. I just went to a farm out in Concord this weekend and got those. And then I really love in my salads, um, this is actually a balsamic caramelized onion. Um, I like a lot of onions. I'm probably crazy and smell because I like so many onions, um, but I think they're delicious. And the whole Allium family, the onion family of garlic, shallots, leeks, has a lot of great anti-cancer health benefits. Some goat cheese, because who doesn't love goat cheese for a little bit of tartness and creaminess. And then I actually have some mint um, from outside that I just tear up to try to get some of the flavors out of it and you kind of massage it and tear it as you go. And then the last thing would just be a couple handfuls of mixed greens. I have arugula and a mixed green and then it ends up looking like this. It's really beautiful. And then when you want to eat it, you just tip it over, shake it, and that's it. All done. Thank you. Yum, that looked delicious. That did look amazing, thank you. Thank so you. now we want to address your questions. Thank you all for being so patient. So I'm going to open the chat box and yet yeah, Elle and I are going to read the questions to our nutritionists. So um, this is a question for Samantha. You talked about watching out for added sugars and to look at the daily value percentage. Should we also be concerned about the total natural sugars, even if there really isn't a daily value percentage added to that? In a way, yes. I would look at the food as a whole, um, and you can look at the total carbohydrates, um, but really we're focused on limiting added sugars because natural sugars, as in fruit and um, the carbohydrates that come from like cow's milk, those are naturally occurring, and those usually come with other, other vitamins and minerals. So like the, the sugar that is in fruit, it comes with fiber from the peel and the fruit itself. So that'll slow the entry of the sugar into the bloodstream, which is what we want. Um, whereas something like a sugar sweetened beverage with added sugar, and it's all sugar, it doesn't have protein, it doesn't have fat, it doesn't have fiber to slow that absorption, it's gonna create that sugar spike is what we don't want. Um, so really just looking at the nutrition label and looking at the total number of carbohydrates and then dissecting it even further and looking at how many added sugars there are in the proportion. Thank you. Here's a question for Carol. It's about processed meats. So, you know, Samantha discussed the importance of avoiding processed meats. What about processed meats ma manufactured by companies such as Applegate that, that don't use nitrate, that may be natural ways to process the meat? What are your thoughts about that? Oops, Carol, you're on mute, I think. Let's see. Hi, that's a great question. Um, I, I still would say that trying to limit those during the week, maybe once or twice a week would still be a good idea. They're still salted and preserved. Um, and we also have to think about, I think the language that we use surrounding um, what we mean when we say um, cancer prevention when it comes to some of the processed meats. Um, it certainly does lower your, your risk to avoid them, but very slightly. So it's really about lessening the amount. If that's something that you are having every day, I would think about mixing it up. Maybe you can cook extra chicken the night before and make a delicious chicken salad with grapes and walnuts and Greek yogurt um, for a couple of the days and maybe maybe swap, swap out the apple gate. I think it's a, a decent option, but I, I think there's always ways you can do better too. Thank you. Um, here's a good question for Samantha, who I know is very into sports and athletics. If you're looking for a protein powder, what should you look for to optimize to find the most healthy option out there? Um, I, one, I think it depends on the person. Um, there are some, and Carol, you can chime in here too, because I know you're, you're a big runner. Um, but I think it, there are, there's a lot of different options. And if you go to a health food store like GNC or other, um, other stores that sell tons and tons, you feel, you'll see a whole shelf or a whole wall full of protein powders. Um, I particularly like whey um, protein powder versus soy. That's just me because I, I tolerate it. Um, 
but don't be, make sure you look at the, the uh, again, I'm like a broken record with the uh, nutrition label, but sometimes those powders can have a lot of protein at once. Um, and really, I would say less than 30 grams at a time. So you may have to experiment a little bit of what you like. Um, Carol, I don't know if you have any preferred brands. Um, I, yeah, I think it depends on your nutrition philosophy too. If, um, and it depends on what's going on in your, your life. Um, older individuals do need a little bit more protein spread evenly throughout the day. Um, and whey seems to be a better protein the older we get. Um, just the amino acid profile that has the branch chain amino acid leucine is not as well utilized as we get older. So that's actually something to look to if you are trying to build muscle mass. Um, but then if you prefer to do more plant-based, there's a ton of plant-based protein powder options. Um, there's the, the pea protein powders. I just personally have a hard time drinking. So it's a, it is a personal decision, I think, for a lot of reasons. But I think if you want the best for muscle mass, if you're doing a lot of activity, I think whey is pretty good. And there are some good environmentally conscious whey brands out there. And I will say that a lot of um, protein powders, they'll sell smaller um, packages of certain powders. So it's a good way to try some. Um, you can try a different couple flavors. If you like unflavored or vanilla, you, there's, there's a lot of different options. And um, I would just experiment and see which one, which flavors and which brands you like the best. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I can ask all of you guys, which would you prefer, a smoothie with protein powder before a workout or after, um, like running and swimming? And if after, what would you suggest pre-workout? Mm -hmm. So I would, a smoothie with the extra protein, I would wait until after. Um, for a pre-workout, it depends on what you're doing, right? Like if you're doing a lot of um, cardiovascular activity, I would eat actually something that's a simple carb. Correct me if I'm wrong, Carol, if you would, uh, suggest something different, but um, that's what I would usually suggest is something a, a simple carb like 30 to 60 minutes before activity. Um, Carol, what do you think? Ah, I, I totally agree. So um, there, there is a whole deep dive school of thought out there that even endurance athletes can survive on a lot less carbohydrate than we used to think, but the research isn't there yet. So um, I would say, yeah, a fast acting, easily digested carb. A banana is a classic for good reason. It's easy to get down. Um, oatmeal would be a great option. A quick, like even instant oatmeal that has a little bit of refined carbohydrate could be okay before a workout. Um, it really, even if it's just a half a cup, Agree, a quick carb before and protein after. All right, thanks so much everyone for tuning in this week.